Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome back to the Jack and Joe show one day later than scheduled. So our massive apologies if you were missing us. If you weren't, then welcome back anyway, because we're thrilled to be talking all about the Bournemouth game. Um, less so thrilled to be talking about the West Ham game. So we will breeze over it. It's been and gone. A lot of time has passed. A bit of one water under the bridge by now as well. But Jack, how are you doing? Yeah, um, Sunday was a long time ago and I feel like it's not relevant anymore. So let's not talk about what happened. <laughs> um, just one of those very infuriating Premier League stupid things that we've actually, you know, discussed before on SW6 Essentials. You know, we played Spurs and with a Lamina yellow card, but let's very briefly talk about it because it has to be addressed. Yeah, it does. Um, I don't really want to focus on the incidents of handball or the penalty, if I'm being honest, because I think that that's been done. I think that everyone knows that we've been a bit mugged off, to say mm. the least. Um, and I don't think that needs to be said again. What I want to talk to you about, Jack, is a few things that happened throughout the game. I think there was two main parts of this game, um, or even three. I think that the first half an hour, up to the penalty being conceded, we were fantastic. Um, and it's the best I've seen us play in a while. I think that that first half an hour mirrored um, parts of that Forest game, but in a longer stretch where we were so good going forward, we looked really dangerous, really quick. Um, I then think the game turned after that penalty um, and obviously turned again when we went 2-1 down, when our heads dropped a bit. I, I want your thoughts on how we performed on the day um, and taking into account that we were still missing some very key players in terms of just the performance, not looking at any of the controversies. What were your thoughts on the game? Um, OK, let me break this up into two parts the first half an hour and the last half an hour. Like you said, we utilised everything we could out of that game the first half an hour, got a goal, looked pretty solid at the back without the likes of Mitrovic, without the likes of Kenny Tete. Um, and I just thought we were really mature. We utilised the space that West Ham always seemed to leave on the break. Cabano with Pereira, the combination was good. And you're sort of thinking when Pereira's got the ball in the wing, you know, albeit it was a very short period of time, you're thinking, well, where's he going to go with this? And he just lashes one top, yeah. <laughs> top bins. Um, it was very hard to contain myself from where I was sitting, but um, very exciting. And it was all about, right, game management. How do we manage this now against the West Ham team? Who, And to be fair, last week I called it. I said they start slow. And yeah. We could nick an early goal, of which we did. And then they'll grow back into it in the second half. Um, what was key for me was that we were we were keeping things very tight at the back. We were looking pretty solid, like you said, best some of the best stuff we played all season. But the penalty happens and it just swings the pendulum completely. The yeah. whole game just completely swings, and it was one of the. You know, I, I know you didn't want to get into specifics, but specifics, but it's one of the stupidest penalties I've ever seen conceded yeah, from our yeah, end, and, and whatever happened happened. Um. And from there, I was alarmed because it didn't seem, apart from, and this is my second part now, the second half an hour, the last half an hour of the game, apart from that Kearney shot, which was cleared basically not even off the line by Cresswell, it was basically in the six-yard area, we weren't creating a hell of a lot. And when we had the ball in those spells going towards the final third, going in towards the box, I never felt like we were going to score or create anything of any, any possibility. And the low XG numbers... We never really mention XG on this um, no on, on this show unless we talk about Brighton and Hove Albion, but um, it was very low, and I just didn't see a scoring. Um, and and whatever happened with the nonsense of the second and third goals, did West Ham deserve a draw at least? Yes. Did we deserve yeah. to lose the game? Mm, maybe. But we if didn't someone was gonna going to deserve to lose it, we were not the best team on the day. That's for sure. No. But the first half hour was extremely encouraging. Yeah. Basically, Pereira or whatever happened with Dawson, it basically just changed the whole game and, and for a mentality shift from, I think, the players, which was extremely disappointing to see because it was there for the taking. Sunday, West Ham had played in Europe on Thursday and we were 1 0 up after five minutes. And I didn't really see what happened coming. And that's very no. frustrating, Joe. Very. And what frustrated me was chance creation, as you're saying, in, in terms of both ends of the pitch and the fact that West Ham 
Um, I actually th thought they were more dangerous. At the end of the first half, they had several high-quality chances, um, including the Skamaka header when we'd just gone 1-0 up, including the um, uh, double save from Leno just before the corner came in that led to the penalty. Skamaka going through and putting it just wide. They had many, many chances. Um, in the second half, ironically, I know they scored twice, I don't think they troubled us much. No. Um, we didn't trouble them much either, but I thought it was a, a half where nothing really happened, in all honesty. I know that the two goals did, um, but it was a bit of a nothing half. And that's what frustrated me, is that we didn't look like getting back into the game. After that, Dan James, fantastic shot, hit the bar after about oh, yeah, of course. 15 minutes. Um, we didn't really trouble them. The Kearney shot, I mean, yeah, cleared off the line. I think Fabianski had it covered. That was mm. the best it got, um, which is really disappointing. Um, I think the thing to note here is that it was a freak game, the same as Newcastle. Um, but despite that, I'm concerned with how many high quality chances we are conceding. Mm. Um, and it needs to turn because these next four games, Bournemouth, which we'll talk about in a second, uh, Aston Villa, Leeds and Everton are four games where these are not prolific teams that we are going up against. So this maybe will be more of a marker um, in terms of how we fare defensively in these four games. I think that will be a good uh, sign of how we're doing at the back because West Ham, Newcastle, obviously, for obvious reasons with the red card, but they were creating chances at will. West Ham were as well. Um, and they're a better team than they've shown so far this season. They have a lot of quality. Um, but there were parts of this game that worried me. Um, now, Jack, I've got to say, is there anything else you want to touch on from this horrible, horrible game? The Skamaka goal, I just want to briefly talk about it. Go on, it, go on, do it. It didn't feel like anything had happened. No. So basically, when you put a ball in the net, you're meant to celebrate, and the crowd are meant to celebrate and, and cheer and jump up and down. None of that happened. You could hear... People go, yeah, because the ball's in the net, right? Like, yeah. you wouldn't realise if it, if it was offside or, or there was a handball. Ironically, of course, there, there was a handball. Skamaka stopped. Everyone stopped. And then I saw, I think it was Lucas Paqueta, after about 10 seconds, where everyone was like, what is going on? Just like sort of put his hands up like that and towards the crowd. And then everyone was like, oh, it's a goal then. So everyone started ce celebrating. And then they check it. And it's really frustrating because... From where I am, I've got all these West Ham fans behind me who are sort of trying to peer under my monitor and be like, oh, is it in? And then and then you see the green and he's like onside and everyone's like cheering behind me because they know and I know. And I'm like, this is horrible. Yeah. And then they're like checking handball. And I was like, brilliant. Finally, some sense. Yeah. And then I see it and I go, well, that's going to get chalked off, surely. And I'm thinking, well, how long has it got to take? How long is it going to take? And then obviously it was given. I was I, I just sort of looking around me going, what, what's going on? And then... Briefly, the third goal. I, I know we said we weren't going to talk about it, but you've got me started now. No, fair enough. How how is it not? Is has it been checked? No one. I, I guess everything no, gets checked. No, but here's why the thing. wasn't it checked extensive, extensively? It has been checked, but the rule is so stupid. Uh, and you've got me started now. <laughs> um, <laughs> I thought we were getting to it. To be fair, for anyone that doesn't know why this goal was stood, you will not believe your ears. Um, a second phase of play began once Leno saved Antonio's initial shot and then Ream touches the ball and they sort of cock it up a little bit. But let's face it, it shouldn't have it been in mess. that position. That counts as apparently a second phase of play. There's no thought given to how that first phase of play started with Antonio mm -hmm. basketballing it, dribbling it down <laughs> the pitch. Um, and then putting in an absolutely useless shot because he's an absolute donkey, by the way. He's a donkey. Oh, no. He's a rubbish player. Um, he's going to bag at Craven Cottage and celebrate in front of me now. Um, and probably go like that. Um, I think I think that my, my issue with this, this rule is, is Leno meant to just let the ball go in? Because essentially, if that ball goes in from the initial shot, mm. the goal doesn't stand. And that is what I can't wrap my head around because it was checked. It was handball, but it's a different phase of play that led to the goal. In order to get to phase phase two, you have to go through phase one. If there's an yeah. injunction in phase one, yeah. then there shouldn't be a phase two. I mean, no. it's ridiculous. Um, I think I think let's park it there. Otherwise, we're just going to... Let's park just it there. Get... Um, two things. Firstly, Jack, let's get ready to get on to Bournemouth. 
but also big happy birthday to um scott parker today uh, obviously <laughs> friend friend of the channel so big happy birthday scott parker thank you for your service um in all our humorous videos of course um but jack uh let's get into previewing the bournemouth match and just before we do that um i think we've got some quite exciting news my goodness my goodness we have some exciting news uh i'm really delighted to say that uh we are delighted yeah. and excited to announce that the jack and joe show is sponsored by our friends at betmate would you believe it joe Oh, well, I'm I'm thrilled. Uh, we sort of mentioned this a couple of weeks ago, and now we're delighted to fully announce it. Um, we are now sponsored by Betmate. Um, Betmate is a fantasy football app with a twist. So myself and Jack, as we mentioned before, play FPL regularly, as many of you do. Um, and we're thrilled to be giving Betmate a go as a result of this, where every week we will select our seven-a-side team and compete against each other, other Betmate users, and hopefully yourselves as well, if you want to get involved. Um, before we talk a little bit more about the app and how it works, Jack, I reckon we should show our our teams that we've selected for this weekend. Yeah, so of course, if you uh, if you want to join and enter the guaranteed uh, £400 pot for the winner, uh, th this is how you do it. So you've got uh, your Prem Saturday 3pm kickoff, where basically it's Fulham versus Bournemouth, and uh, the other fixture is Wolves versus Nottingham Forest. Uh, it's a £2 entry fee with, like you said, a guaranteed pot of £400. We both have picked our teams, um, which basically collaborate. Well, you can have a look now. My team is this. So, seven aside uh, with a vice and a captain. So, you obviously, you can see Leno in goal with Robinson at the back. Former Fulham player, Nico Williams at the back. Uh, Matthias Nunez uh, in the middle is my vice. Jao Pellini, of course, my captain. Uh, up front, Brennan Johnson, who could bag, you never know. And of course, Alexander Mitrovic. Whether we see him on Saturday remains to be the case. Joe, what about your team? Well, I've got a couple of similar players and a couple of different ones. So I've definitely gone with Robinson and Mitrovic. Um, gone slightly defensive on the Wolves front. They don't score many, but they don't concede many either. There was no way in hell I was going to go with a Wolves striker for this one. Um, Dennis got his goal for Forest. We can't select a team of all Fulham players, of course. I think the maximum is four in your squad for this fixture, uh, where we've only got the two games. Um, for those that play fantasy football, you will know how it works. and It's very similar. You get points for the positive things that these players do. So defenders get clean sheet points, strikers and anyone else gets obviously goal points. Your captain gets double points. And slight difference here, your vice captain gets 1.5 the amount of points that they would get if they weren't, uh, well, if they were just a normal player. So, for example, Pereira would get 1.5, the amount of points that Nunes got if they got the same amount in the match. Um, I think that this is really exciting. I think that it's really fun, um, really excited to get involved in general, but it would be awesome if you guys could play along with us. Um, if you sign up um, using the code FULHAMISH5, then you will receive five pounds in free bets where yes. you can join pots such as this, maybe not necessarily this weekend, but in the future. Uh, and you can play against us every week. We'll be reviewing our teams and previewing the next week's teams as well um, to see how we get along. I mean, Jack, I'm worried for you and Nico Williams at the back. I've got to say, um, <laughs> I think that he leaks a few and I think that Serge Aurier could get the start, but this is the beauty of it. You've got a subs bench as well with other players you can bring on. Mm. Um, and I think that a lot of people that I've spoken to love a bit of fancy football action. So why not get involved? But Jack, myself, I don't want to voice over what you're about to say, but thrilled to announce this sponsorship with Betmate uh, and really keen to get started this weekend. Really excited. And of course, if you don't like your lineup, you can change your team up to five minutes before kickoff. So you can look at your lineup and go, well, Nico Williams is not there. Let me put in, I don't know, like you said, Serge, Serge Aurier. Aurier. Yeah. Or like Johnny Ignori, you never know. Depending on who, obviously, who Wolves play and who um, who Forest play when it comes to two o'clock on Saturday, we are playing Bournemouth. Yeah. Now then, at the beginning of the season, I was thinking this is going to be a big one because it's going to be Scott Parker. Like he said, it's his birthday today. Happy birthday! Happy birthday, Scott! <laughs> back yeah. at his own, back at Fulham uh, in the Premier League. But there's been this sort of weird thing, very weird thing where he's gone after a 9-0 defeat, which is not a weird thing. Then the caretaker manager has... Uh, O'Neill came in, 
They've now five unbeaten. They're above us in the league. And Fulham fans and Bournemouth fans are getting along because we both agree that Parker was not good for both of us. He was like a toxic ex-girlfriend. And now he's gone, we can sort of move on with our lives and be much more happy. Certainly can relate to that. Joe, what do you think about this game? I think that this is a really tough game. I don't think that it has the added bite that it would have done had Scott Parker been manager. But it's definitely an important game. I know we're currently eighth and ninth, respectively, in the league this season. But I doubt we're going to end it there, either of us. Um, Since Gary O'Neill's come in, Bournemouth have been very, very solid. They haven't lost a game yet. They haven't lost a game in general this season against anyone that isn't a traditional top six team. So I think those were Arsenal, Liverpool and going to forget the third one now. Who else did they play that's in the top six? City. Uh, Their only team to stop Haaland scoring, I believe, Um, which is, you know, fair play. I know they conceded four, but fair play. I think we take that next month at this rate. Um, Solid team. Um, Unspectacular, not the most prolific, but a very hardworking side that are clearly drilled very well. Um, Senesi, their new signing from, I believe, final has come in at the back and done very well the last couple of weeks, coupled with um, Chris Meppham. Uh, Kelly's not playing at the moment, not yourself, Jack, but um, Mr Lloyd, um, who would normally be their captain. Um, yeah. And Neto in goal has been quite impressive. I've got to say, I, I thought that when Travers, uh, their keeper from last season, who was fantastic, it's got to be said, um, last year, got dropped after that 9-0 Liverpool game. I was thinking, oh, this is a bit harsh. But Neto's done very well since he's come in. It's giving me... Um, Ariola coming in ahead of Rodak vibes, or even Leno coming in ahead of Rodak vibes, where it didn't seem the most fair at the time, but he's clearly a better overall shot stopper and keeper, effectively. Um, Phil Billing's been in great form. Mm. Um, Solanke is no longer injured. He's up top. They've sometimes been going with Kiefer Moore as well. Um, physical team, going to be a tough game. Jack, I think it's one where we've got to target three points. Something I'm looking for in this game is conceding one or less because we've only Mm. done that twice this season in the Brighton game and in the Wolves fixture of course um what are your thoughts I've rambled on for a bit there um and how do you think we should approach this one well I think given the last two results and you know the nonsense that's gone on in in both those games it feels like we're going to actually play a proper game of football um at last and look when this fixture obviously was going to be apparent for, for this season after they got promoted. Was I thinking this is going to be a battle between 8th versus ninth at this no. stage of the season? No. But here we are, and their tails are going to be up. You know, when Leicester beat Forest 4-0 and they had Bournemouth away, I was thinking, well, this is a chance for Leicester to really kick on, and obviously they went 1-0 up. And I did not expect, even in the current form that Bournemouth were in, four unbeaten at the time, that they go on and win that game. Good volley by Billing. Yeah, sort of weird goal from Christie, but you know it, it went in, and they saw the Danny game. Danny Ward tax, isn't it? I guess in goal. Yeah, no, that is true. Obviously, they got the third, which was then chalked off for offside. So they did win the game two one. And this is a game now where I'm thinking, you know, obviously yeah, at the beginning of the season, thinking bank, we need three points, we have to win. And obviously, we still do, but I'm fearing it. Yeah. I'm really fearing it because of the form that we're in. Two defeats on the bounce. Whether Mitro comes back or not, we don't know. He's still going to be slightly unfit, maybe off the pace of it, and we need him firing. And I'm just a little bit apprehensive. You know, I think we've got enough to win the game. And I think with our attacking talents that we have shown so far this season, we we have goals in us and and three points in us. But I just don't know. I just don't know under this new Gary O'Neill, Gary O'Neill's Bournemouth. So a score prediction I'm going to ask you for. I just just don't know. It's incredible. It's going to be a tough game. Um, and it's one that I really would not be surprised if we drew and ended up thinking, you know what, that's an all right result, mm. um, which is not something I'd be expecting to say. Obviously, I want to win. Um, I'm, I'm obviously not ruling out a defeat, you know, the way we're leaking goals and the way Bournemouth are playing at all. Um, I just think at home that I'm hoping that we can get another positive performance in the bank. Um, I'm going to go for a 2-1 Fulham win. I would not be surprised if this game ended one all, um, as yeah. they did both last season. And as mm. I seem to predict every single week in my life for every game <laughs> ever, other than Man City away, which will obviously be a 1-0 Fulham win. Um, <laughs> I think that the team news is dependent on how I'm going to feel for this. So 
the way I'm thinking with a team, Jack, is it is all dependent on who's back. So if Tete's back fit, I'd start him. If Mitrovic is back fit, and I mean fit, not getting back to fitness, I would mm. start him. If not, I think you continue with a very similar team. The question marks I have are, firstly, Bobby Reed at right back. I thought he did fine. I'm not going to shit on him for being slightly further back than the others for that um, for that goal. He's not a right back. I thought he did an okay job. I'd rather see him up on the wing. and I'd rather see him on the wing currently than Dan James. Uh, I thought Cabano did very well, but I would like to see Cabano on one side and Bobby Reed on the right. I'm hoping that Tete's back. If he's not, I am fine with going in Barbu for this one, purely because after Silva's comments last week, if Mbabu doesn't play out of his skin this time, then when's he going to? He knows that he needs to perform, but I'm pinning all my hopes on Tete being back fit. But this is the interesting one, Jack. Centre-backs. As it goes, I think Tosin and Ream were overall fine on, um, on Sunday. I don't think mm. they were particularly bad. I think, you know, Ream obviously made a bit of a mistake with the third goal, but it shouldn't have been in that position in the first place. We're mm. leaking a lot of goals and we've brought in a £15 million defender, our star defensive signing of the summer, even a little bit over £15 million, I think, perhaps close to 17 not sure, um, with add-ons. It's a Diop or even Shane Duffy. I feel like at this point, if one of them doesn't come in, they have to be asking themselves, what has to happen for us to come in? Mm. Because we're leaking goals um, and it, we've been leaking goals all season and I think that individually, Tosin and Reem have been fine. In particular, Tim Reem, I think, has been a credit to the club, a fantastic captain and, you know, outperformed all of our expectations. But at the same time, we've got someone on the bench we brought in for big money that Silver clearly wanted and trusts. This would have to be the game that he comes in. And if he comes in, I can only see it being for... Well, actually, that's the thing. I was going to say I can only see it being for Tosin. Because I think Ream's been great. But I also can't see him dropping toes in. So what do you think, Jack? Oh, yeah, it's a bit of a... What, what troubles me is, through no fault of our own, we haven't been able to have a settled back four at all this season because of the yeah. injuries. You know, since Robertson and Tete have been out for, for an extended period of time, we've had to chop and change. And obviously, you know, over the years, under Slav and under um, Parker, that, that, you know, was... That was the start of our downfall, basically. Um, but but this seems a little bit, you know, circumstantial of injuries. Um, I'm not sure. Because I think you're right in saying that Tosin, there's a point where he could be dropped. And there's also a point where, where Ream could be dropped as well for Diop. From what I saw from Diop against Crawley, he was terrible. From what I saw yeah. against from Diop against Forrest, he was brilliant. Like, utterly solid. And a big reason why we got those three points. Big three points. I'm going to put my neck out here and say Diop Tosin against okay. um, against uh, Bournemouth because it was just a little bit comical, that third goal. And, you know, you can say what you like about, you know, we already discussed it. It just is something that sort of gave me a bit of PTSD. Like, I've seen that before in the Premier League I think like Arsenal on the opening day where Ream just got in a bit of a mix up. I love Tim Ream more than, you know, any most Fulham players ever. But I just feel like now where we do start need to picking up some more points. I think this is the time where I'd go with Diop and Tosin and just see how that partnership goes. Yeah. And I think it sounds that, uh, harsh, but I, I, I apologise. I but. think that it is harsh. And I think that it's always going to be harsh because yeah. I think they've both been fine. But let's face it, um, I don't think you can call your centre-backs very good if they're shipping this many because no. then there's something wrong. They lost, they both, both criminal for it, not just one. Both lost Skamaka so many times throughout this game. Um, and Dom Solanke is a player that can cause problems, you know. Um, in my head, rent free. Yeah, yeah. I mean, let's face it, he scored against us twice last season. One was a pen penalty. The other one was a great move. And he's a striker that has got good movement. He works hard. He's mates with Tosin. In real life, I know that Tosin gave a bit back last season with the old bow and arrow, like Mister Mister Robin Hood. Oh, right. Yes, um, <laughs> I don't know. It's a tough one and it's a tough call, but it was a tougher call at the time to drop Rodak for Leno because Leno was um, Rodak was doing nothing particularly wrong. It was a tougher call, perhaps, 
to, you know, drop Cabano for Willian, for example. Things like this, you know, it happens. Um, we have a time now where we've got two games, well, let's say three games in a week. Mm. Um, that is time for a centre-back partnership to bloom, to blossom. Um, and I really hope that whoever it is, we just tighten it up at the back. But I would not be surprised if Diop comes in. I wouldn't be completely surprised if Duffy came in. Um, mm. But I think that it would be Diop that did if anyone was going to switch up this partnership. Well, I suppose if Duffy comes in, we'd have to be you know, begging him for mercy. But um, we'll, we'll see. Uh, I, I, at some point, I had to make that. I had to yeah. make it. Um, in terms of the score prediction, I'm going to go with Fulham 1, Bournemouth 0. Clean sheet. I would love it. First half goal from Bobby de Cordova Reed. Okay. Uh, he, you know, he might not play, but if not, I'll go Niska de Cabano. By the way, great article in the Athletic by Peter Rutz yes. on Niska de Cabano. Really heartwarming. And just why we love this club and why we love players like Niska de Cabano. Joe, this has been the Jack and Joe show, Bournemouth preview, sponsored by Betmate. We're very, very excited to say that. And we thank them for their sponsorship for this video. Yeah, and thank you to everyone for watching as well. Um, do feel free to click on the link in the description to play along with us on Betmate. I think it'll be really fun. Um, if it's not your thing, completely understandable, but we'll still be showing you our teams anyway, and we hope you find that interesting because I love a bit of fancy football action, as does Jack. Um, and we both got Fulham players in our team for this weekend because we both have predicted us to get the three points. Fingers crossed we can do it. Um, enjoy the game. And also... Enjoy if you're sitting in the Riverside Upper, the Ooh. section on the other side now, which is open. Another 700 seats opened. I checked this morning, about half of them gone. I'm sure that it'll be pretty much a sellout by the time that Saturday 3 p.m. rolls around. But enjoy the game and thanks for watching. Yeah, guys, honestly, thanks so much for your support um, so far this season and on the videos. We'll be back next week, same time Wednesday. Obviously, today's Thursday to Wednesday. Normal to time Wednesday, yeah. Normal time, yeah. Villa at home is Thursday night. We will be previewing not only that, but Leeds away as well. Because uh, obviously that's on the Sunday. We probably will not have a video in between Villa and Leeds. Unless we go and beat Villa by seven goals to nil. You in that know. case, you'll be probably getting a, a very happy video about 11.30pm on Thursday night. <laughs> Slightly drunken, perhaps. We, we, we shall see. Um, yeah, so enjoy the Bournemouth game. Thanks so much for watching. We're going to be back next week for the Jack and Joe show. And, oh, my gosh. Uh, thanks very much for watching. Joe, thanks so much for being here. Thank you very much, Jack. Thanks for watching, guys. See you next week. It's been a blast, as always. Thanks so much. Half an hour of Jack and Joe show content, basically. And that will see you through to the Bournemouth game. Go well, guys, and come on Fulham. Mm -hmm.